Yeah, so thanks Charlie for the introduction and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak about this work. Uh, so as Charlie mentioned, uh, the talk is somehow related to what Basil was talking about, but in a perhaps slightly different configuration of, of uh, convection driven by internal heating. Uh, and I should mention that I've done this work in collaboration with Ali Arslan, who's a PhD student uh, at Imperial, with Andy Wynn and with John Kras, uh, who, have, uh, who have had quite a good, uh, good input into this work. So I, I don't have to convince you that convection is important uh, because it's the way in which nature moves stuff around uh, on any scale that is not microscopic enough for diffusion to be important. Uh, so this goes to something that's like a uh, small scale for us, like drying paint or electronic device cooling, all the way through uh, heating our rooms or cooking soup and, and all the way up to uh, geophysical and astrophysical scales. Now, the way that we uh, force convection as these different scales uh, can vary. So for instance, when we're drying paint, uh, the convection is driven by surface tension. Uh, the, uh, the standard Rayleigh Bernard convection is boundary driven. So for instance, central heating, we have a radiator on the boundary or soup we heat from the bottom. Uh, but for astrophysical and geophysical application, the driving force is internally uh, generated heat by chemical reaction, nuclear reactions. And this is the type of convection that I want to focus on today uh, along the lines of what Basil was talking about earlier. Uh, so I'm gonna consider a similar uh, idealized and non-dimensional model where I have a layer of fluid in a rectangular box uh, bounded at the top and at the bottom by two plates, uh, which I have that temperature T equals zero. So here everything is non-dimensional. Uh, and uh, the plates satisfy non-slip boundary conditions. The fluid is periodic in the horizontal directions uh, and I do apologize for the siren that just went by. Uh, but yeah, so the fluid is, uh, is periodic in the horizontal direction and is heated uniformly in this case, contrary to what Basil was talking about uh, in the entire layer. So we have a heat source, which is non-dimensionalized to unity, uh, which is adding heat to our fluid uh, in the entirety of the layer. Uh, the equations are the Boussinesq equation, which are normalized in a similar way uh, to what we saw in the previous talk with the only difference that the Rayleigh number R here appears in the momentum equation and, and gives us the force of this, uh, of the, the magnitude of this buoyancy force. Uh, then we have incompressibility and we have the heat equation where this plus one just represents the, uh, the source of, of heat that's distributed uh, in, the, in the layer. So we have some non-dimensional parameters uh, as, uh, as you probably remember from the previous talk. The first one is the Rayleigh number, which again measures the strength of the heating, which I've non-dimensionalized to be one. So this R becomes large when there is strong um, forcing, we expect conven convection to be strong and, and turbulence to occur. Then we have the Prandtl number, which is a property of uh, how much momentum diffuses compared to heat. Uh, and then we also have the uh, horizontal periods, uh, LX and LY of this box, uh, which will not play uh, a role in what follows. So all of the results and all of the discussion uh, that I'm going to, to show you later uh, will focus on the Rayleigh number R uh, and all of the results will be independent of the Prandtl number on end of the horizontal periods. So with this setup, the quantity I want to focus on is the mean vertical heat flux through the layer. And this turns out to be exactly the same as the convective vertical heat flux, which is an average of Wt. So W here is the vertical velocity uh, and T is the temperature. And this quantity turns out to be related uh, to the heat flux through the top and the bottom plates. So on average, the fraction of the heat that we add that goes out to the top, uh, which is just the mean uh, vertical gradient of the temperature, is just a half plus the convective mean convective heat flux. And similarly, the fraction of heat that leads through the bottom is a half minus uh, the vertical heat flux. So when we have convection and this heat flux is positive, as we will see, uh, then the flow is asymmetric and more heat leaves through the top than it does through the bottom. So the question that I want to ask is how does this heat flux vary with the heating rate or in other words, in non-dimensional terms with the Rayleigh number? Now, I'm not the first person to ask this question clearly. So we, we already know a few things about this. And the first thing that we know is that the uh, steady state in which we have no convection, but just conduction uh, is stable asymptotically when the Rayleigh number is very small. So when the Rayleigh number is smaller than about 27,000, nothing happens, the flow, fluid is stationary and there is no convexity, convective heat flux. So WT on average is zero. On the other hand, when the Rayleigh number is large enough, 
larger than about 37,000, then convection is linearly unstable. And in this case, we do get convection and the heat flux increases as we raise the Rayleigh number. Now here I'm showing some experimental data, some numerical data in 3D and 2D. And you can see that as I keep increasing the Rayleigh number here, the 3D and 2D data start to disagree. So in 3D, the heat flux keeps increasing, but in 2D it sort of increases and then it looks like it's turning back down. In the middle here, there's a gray area and that's exactly what it is because it's a region of bistability where we can have both convection and, and conduction. They're both, uh, conduction is linearly stable, so it is locally stable and we get this bistability. We also have a rigorous bound, uh, very much like Basil mentioned earlier, but it's a different type of bound. In this case, uh, David Goluskin and, and Ed Spiegel proved that no matter what the Rayleigh number is, this vertical heat flux cannot exceed a half. So no matter what this data will do as we keep increasing the Rayleigh number, we have to be below this dashed line over here. The real question that I don't think anyone has a good answer for or even a feeling for is what happens uh, to the data as we keep increasing the Rayleigh number. Now, one might expect if you look at these three data, that this, this heat flux will keep increasing and perhaps, well, we know that it can't go uh, beyond the half, so it will have to level off at some point uh, but we don't know whether it will asymptote to a half, whether it will asymptote to a smaller number, or whether, as we see for the 2D data, it will turn back down. So the question I want to ask in this talk is whether we can improve on this upper bound uh, proven by, by Goluskin and Spiegel, uh, and perhaps come up with a really dependent bound uh, that has a functional form uh, like, like this. So there would be a constant, which would be the asymptote, and perhaps a power law correction uh, so that we asymptote this constant from below. Uh, and, and currently we have no expectation whether this constant should be a half or it should be something smaller than a half. So this is part of the question. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the talk, I will convince you that perhaps it is possible uh, to, uh, to end up with something like this, uh, but there are also mathematical challenges that need to be resolved uh, if you want to obtain this kind of result. So to prove this bound, uh, we need to do some maths. And the starting point is perhaps uh, uh, something that is quite simple, but maybe you haven't thought about before. Uh, and it is the following. So suppose I take a function V uh, of the flow velocity U and the temperature. And I take the time derivative of this, and then I average. Then the result of this uh, is, is exactly zero. And this is a straightforward application of the fundamental calculus because I can integrate this time derivative. I just get V at times tau much uh, divided by, by the time tau uh, and the numerator if v is bounded remains bounded whereas the denominator goes to infinity and so the limit of this quantity is zero. So now I can cleverly disguise zero in the form of this time average uh, and I can add this time average to the uh, vertical heat transport to obtain an identity that looks, looks like this. Then I can use the chain rule uh, to rewrite uh, this expression as the space time average of a quantity here where I have the time derivative of, of u and the time derivative of d. This is just an application of the chain rule of my functional v. Now what I can do, I can plug in the governing equation, so the momentum equation, because I know how du by dt behaves, and the same here for dt by dt, the temperature by time, uh, because we know the heat equation. So if we do this, we end up with a space-time average, uh, which is exactly the same of a one is exactly the same space-time average as the uh, flux that we're interested in. Uh, and now we have this D, which is an expression that depends on the velocity and the temperature, uh, but not on time explicitly. So we have a different quantity here, which is the same average as WT. Now I'm going to add zero again by adding and subtracting a constant U. Uh, and I'm going to reach them by taking one U inside the space-time average because the space-time average of a constant is the stack constant and, and rearranging slightly the minus signs. So now I've derived that the mean heat flux in the vertical direction is equal to this constant u minus this expression here. And this is the time average of a spatial average, which I'm gonna call S, that depends on what the velocity is doing and what the temperature is doing. Now, perhaps I can choose this V that I had at the beginning, and this constant u, such that this s, this quantity s, is non-negative 
no matter what the velocity is or what the temperature is, provided that they satisfy physical constraints like the boundary conditions or incompressibility. Now, if I do this, then this time average that I have here is certainly going to be positive, or at least less than or equal to zero. And so the heat flux is going to be equal to U minus something positive, and therefore is going to be less than U. So the name of the game is now to choose a function V and a constant U that make this quantity here S non-negative for all velocities and temperatures that are physically realistic so that they satisfy the boundary conditions and incompressibility. And if I can do this, then I can conclude that my average of WT is less than U. So I immediately obtain an upper bound. So this is a general framework uh, that I can use to, to place bounds on the heat flux. Now, the question is, what should this V be? Now, there are many different choices, uh, but there's a particularly simple one, which amounts to uh, using the background method, which Charlie has, has pioneered over the last 30 or so years. Uh, so this V has three terms. The first one is quadratic in U and is proportional to the kinetic energy of the flow. The second one is proportional to the square of the temperature. And the third one consists of temperature multiplied by a Z dependent function, which I'm just writing as one minus Z plus psi for mathematical convenience. So this is just any generic function of Z and I've added this one minus Z here for mathematical convenience. So now I have three parameters that I can choose, this constant A, this constant B, and this function uh, phi of Z. I won't go into the details of how this connects to a more classical formulation of the background method, but I'll just mention that this A and B, if you're familiar with the background method terminology, are just the balance parameters. Uh, whereas this function here, one minus Z plus psi, uh, is related to the background temperature field by rescaling. So in particular, this, this function divided by B is exactly uh, the background temperature field. So if we take this V and we calculate the quantity S, we obtain this horrible expression over here. We do some integration by parts, we, we manipulate it, and we end up with, with this expression. And the details of these are not, in fact, not, not terribly important, but what is important is that the optimization variables, which I can tune to obtain my bound, uh, which are U, Psi, A, and B, appear linearly inside this expression. So when I pose an optimization problem for the bound on the heat flux by looking for the smallest bound U, such that this S is positive for all reasonable uh, velocity and temperature fields, then this minimization problem here is linear. And this linearity with respect to these optimization parameters here is important because it opens the door to efficient numerical methods with which we can construct suitable bounds U, balance parameters, and suitable background fields, essentially. So we can do this numerically. There's one thing uh, that I want to mention before showing you the results of this computation, and it's about the constraint. So requiring the S is positive for all temperatures and velocities is the same as saying that the minimum of S over temperature and velocity is positive. And so I can rewrite this constraint as a minimization problem. And the reason why this is useful is because associated with any choice of parameters here, there will be a critical velocity and a critical temperature that solve this minimization problem. And this critical temperature can allow us uh, to uh, determine whether the bound that we find is realistic or not. Uh, and, and this critical temperature in particular will become important later. Uh, so, so please keep, keep in mind that this is where it comes from. So as I said, we can plug this problem into the computer and, and solve it with reasonable efficiency. And this is what we get. So here, the green dots on the left are upper bounds that we constructed numerically. And the good news is that if you look at this for Rayleigh numbers that are small enough, then we do better than the uniform bound of half proved by Goluskin and Spiegel. But at the same time, there's bad news because if we increase the Rayleigh number too much, then we go straight past it and we keep going up. So, so this is not so good. But before discussing that, let us look at what the optimal psi and the optimal balance parameters look like. So here we have the optimal psi, which is uh, something that's not unexpected. We have a, a linear region here in the middle of the layer and then two boundary layers near z equals one, which is the top of the domain and, and z equals zero, which is the bottom of the plate. We can actually copy this behavior analytically. So we can approximate these profiles by a piecewise linear uh, ansatz. And we can tune these ansatz to obtain an analytical bound uh, in which the, the heat flux is bounded by a constant 
uh, times Rayleigh to the one fifth. So these bounds that we can prove grow uh, and blow up uh, as Rayleigh to the one fifth, and, and you can see it over here with the black line. Uh, so again, even analytically, we, we can improve on the one half value for a small range of Rayleigh, but then we, we go straight past it and we, we go up to infinity. So if something is missing from our uh, formulation, right? But, but what? And the answer it lies in these critical temperatures that I mentioned. So what you see plotted here is the horizontal average of the critical temperatures plotted as a function of Z, so the, the depth in the fluid layer. Uh, and they're color coded by Rayleigh number, so low Rayleigh number corresponds to this yellow orange and the dark red is higher Rayleigh number. Now you would expect that because we're adding heat into our domain and then the heat is escaping through the top and bottom boundaries that this temperature should be positive. So the physical temperatures in, in, the, in the system should be positive. Uh, and this is true if we look at, the, at these critical average temperatures for most of the layer, except if we look near Z equals zero for the high Rayleigh number, you can just see it dip below zero. So what I'm gonna do now is zoom very close to the boundary to show you this behavior uh, in, a, in a clearer way. So you see that for low Rayleigh number, uh, these critical temperatures have positive average, but as we increase the Rayleigh number, oops, they become negative. Now, quite interestingly, the point at which these averages just touch zero at this point, this corresponds to an upper bound on the, uh, on the heat flux, which is strictly less than a half. And we can keep increasing the Rayleigh number and the point at which this bound reaches exactly a half corresponds to the point, not just when the temperature is negative, but when the gradient of temperature at zero flips from being positive to negative. So we have a little bit of room to play with here. And if we can somehow impose that these temperatures should remain positive, perhaps we can prevent our upper bounds to reach a half and perhaps to asymptote to a half from below. So this is what we tried uh, after noticing this, we scratched our heads about this for, for a bit before, before we observed this. If we look at the scale of the axis, it took us a while to, to actually notice. Uh, but after we noticed, we went back to our bounding frameworks and we said, aha, we should not impose that S is positive for all temperature fields, but only for those that are positive in the domain. Uh, and we can handle this type of constraint numerically and also analytically using our non-negative Lagrange multiplier which I'm going to call Q prime of Z here, which should be non-negative uh, throughout the layer. So for all Z is zero one. Now I define this multiplier as being a derivative just for mathematical convenience, because when I do the implementation and the analysis, I just want to be able to integrate these two terms by parts quite conveniently. Uh, and I take it to depend on Z only and not on the uh, horizontal coordinates because the problem is translation invariance due to periodicity. So it doesn't really matter what the phase of this multiplier is. And we can make a mathematical argument to show that, that this is indeed the case. The point is that now this Q here enters the constraints linearly again, as before. Uh, so once again, this optimization problem on the right hand side is linear and we can plug it into the computer and ask the computer to optimize you, the balance parameters A and B, the profile psi and this Lagrange multiplier Q and see what bounds we obtain. So we did this, the computation turns a little more delicate, uh, but the results uh, are, are significantly better. So when the Rayleigh number is small uh, and we keep turning it up, initially our bounds, which are now the black line, coincide with what we had previously, which are the green dots. But at some point, this positivity constraint on the temperature kicks in. And instead of keeping going on and passing a half and blowing up to plus infinity, we turn and we asymptote to a half from below which is what we were uh, hoping for. And if we look at the gap from a half, we see a linear decrease in log-log scale, which suggests that we've actually computed an upper bound on the, uh, on the vertical heat flux, which is a half minus some power of the Rayleigh number. Now, if you look at the range of Rayleigh numbers here, it's very small. So we can't really predict what the value of C and what the exponent alpha are with any reasonable accuracy or whether this is indeed the, the right functional form as we keep turning the Rayleigh number higher and higher. Uh, but this is what we could compute and it's not unreasonable to expect that, that something like this could be provable. Uh, so it's even more interesting to look at uh, 
the optimal psi. So we, we see this S shape again through the layer, but what you don't see from this big plot is a very, very sharp boundary layer near the bottom of the domain, Z to zero. So I've just magnified here on the left and I've drawn this dotted line to guide the eye. So if from this point over here, we jump over here, and then we very, very quickly shoot up uh, to the value of one. And interestingly, this thin boundary layer is not actually smooth. So there are sharp corners here, as we keep increasing the Rayleigh number, and also over here. So this was uh, a little surprising to start with, uh, but, but it's an effect that is due to the way that the uh, positivity constraint on the temperature works. The optimal Lagrange multiplier is even less smooth. Uh, and, and what I'm plotting here is this multiplier Q on a log scale with Z. So you see a magnified boundary layer here uh, near the bottom uh, of the domain. So if we start from the right here, we see that when Z is one, so we're at the top, this Q has more negative values and they, it remains constant throughout most of the layer until we get to this very thin boundary layer near the bottom where all the interesting stuff happens. And we have a very sharp transition to a region where this Q decays linearly in logarithmic scale. So this is a power law behavior for this multiplier. The width of this region increases with the Rayleigh number and then eventually, when we're very, very close to the boundary, then this Q remains constant again. And you will not be surprised to hear, perhaps, that these sharp transitions correspond exactly to these corners uh, that I've shown you in the optimal phi. So there's some very interesting behavior that's going on in these numerically constructed solutions to this problem uh, that will be interesting to, to sort of uh, study analytically. Finally, what, what about the balance parameters? Well, there's nothing terribly interesting here. Uh, if not that the, uh, when the temperature uh, positivity constraint on the temperature becomes active, then the behavior changes dramatically and these parameters keep start to decay towards zero. Uh, and they seem to decay at the same rate. So, so A scales in the same way as B. In fact, we can say more uh, and everything in the problem scales like B provided that we're sufficiently far away from the boundary. Uh, so what I'm plotting here are the scale profiles, and you can see that if we divide everything by B, uh, these profiles collapse very well. Uh, and we can actually make some skin hypothesis, which say that the amplitude of phi, and in fact also of its derivative are of order B, sufficiently far from the boundary. Q is constant, far from the boundary at the bottom, Z equals zero. Uh, and also if we look at this plot, Z phi prime is constant, uh, at least in a region near the midpoint of the layer where Z equals uh, a half. Uh, and, and this region here is, is of order one. The length of this region is of order one. So the idea now is that we, we kind of understand how these profiles behave. Uh, we have a reasonable understanding of the scaling. Can we turn this understanding into a proof? And this is where the difficulty start. So we can massage our problem for the upper bound a little bit more uh, to obtain a more explicit upper bound in terms of our quantities. Uh, and this holds provided that we have a number of constraints satisfied. Now, I just wanna focus here on the expression for the upper bound and on the last constraint. So if we look at this bound, we have a half here appearing already. So if we want an upper bound, which is less than a half, the other two terms are better sum to something that's negative. And immediately here we have a competition because the first one is positive because it's a square. So we need phi, sorry, psi, to have a positive enough integral to counterbalance uh, the first bad term. Now, unfortunately, we, we can't do whatever we like with psi because we have a constraint. And in this constraint, we also have a competition between two positive terms, uh, which help enforce this inequality. But then we also have a psi dependent term, which is psi indefinite. And so we will have to estimate the size of this term and compare it to these two and make sure that it is smaller than the sum of these two. So the strategy is clear. We have a pretty clear understanding of, of how these variables behave. The problem is that the most straightforward type of construction actually fails. So let's suppose Gio, that one minute, take, one minute. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost done. So let's suppose that we take these quantities to scale like, like they did in the numerics. And in particular here at point four, let's assume that psi prime and Q are constant in some interval around the midpoint of the layer, which is a fixed size of order one, okay? So I'm gonna take these profiles and look at the constraint. 
And then I'm trying to estimate this term of which I don't know the sign using the most standard classical estimates, which are essentially estimating a minus psi prime with its maximum value and then using Poincare inequalities like Basile de Derbier to compare W and T with its derivatives. Now it turns out that under this relatively generic framework, no matter what we do with these particular boundary layers, the best possible bound that we can prove is greater than or equal to a half plus B times a constant. And this constant is positive when the rating number is large enough. So no matter what we do, the best bound that we can prove within this simple approach, which is what normally works, is gonna be greater than a half. So if we are to prove something which is less than a half, we have to be a bit more clever. We have to use a more sophisticated strategy. Uh, so this is where we're at. We haven't solved it yet. Uh, hopefully I've managed to convince you uh, that this problem is quite interesting, both from a physical perspective, because we don't know what happens, and from a mathematical perspective. The important uh, aspect seems to be imposing positivity of the temperature, which perhaps if you're familiar with application of the background method doesn't always appear, uh, especially in Ray Bernard convection, you can easily prove bounds uh, without mentioning the fact that temperature is positive. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to, uh, to think a bit harder uh, about, about how to actually construct these, uh, these proofs analytically. Uh, so, so thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer in here.